Hello, my name is Anthony Andrews uh, from We Are Parable and welcome to the second series of conversations with filmmakers. This time it's around advice to black British creatives. Uh, this is part of the Who We Are takeover, an online takeover that explores the artistry behind black British film. And I'm thrilled to welcome four amazing filmmakers uh, from Britain um, who are creating amazing work. So I'd like to introduce Anthony Vander, Thomasin Adepeju, Nosa Eke, and Stefan Pierre Mitchell. How are you guys all doing? We're good. Good. Well, yeah, good. All right. good, good. Fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. So I was hoping that you could tell me a little bit about yourself for anyone who doesn't necessarily know you. So um, start with Nosa. Could you tell me a little bit about your work and then we'll go, we'll work around the group. Um, just, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Uh, so I guess I call myself a platform agnostic, uh, writer, director, which basically means that I work uh, within traditional uh, like storytelling as well as interactive storytelling. So I kind of make work for pretty much every platform you can tell a story on or possibly tell a story on. So, you know, film, TV, games, voice devices, mobile phones, AR, VR, kind of anything that will allow it. <laughs> and mm -hmm. yeah. I, uh, recently I kind of directed and co-wrote a tra traditional sort of narrative straightforward short film called Something in the Closet that's about a queer teenager yeah. oh thanks Thompson I <laughs> <that. laughs> oh, appreciate that, yeah, that um, brilliant. it's about a queer teenager whose uh, secret sort of manifests itself um, as a monster in the closet and uh, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah I'm just kind of I love I, my thing is sort of taking um, sort of identity identity and like queer like themes and kind of putting them in a genre backdrop and seeing what I can do with the story and so at the moment I'm developing a feature film the BFI um, called The Young and the Dopeness and it's about a sort of queer a teenager who comes across like a sort of young scrappy child and they venture to find uh, the things that they're seeking uh, throughout a night and it's sort of uh, set in the world of streetwear but still very much true to exploring those themes that I like to like to explore. Fantastic thank you. Um, so uh, Stefan can you could, could you tell us a little bit a little bit about yourself and, and your work? Um, so um, what people what some people know in the last four years I was actually a drama scrum classically trained actor you see and um, but I've always had a passion for films and storytelling and that's because of the way I was brought up um, what people don't really know much about me is that I grew up in foster homes and um, from you know my mom being white my dad is actually black Caribbean he's not even African and then at the age of six I sort of you know kind of joined my mother which was married to a nigerian and i i like to think to myself that i've been able to grow up on these three different world caribbean white and an african stepdad and that has shaped me who i am today um born with all kind of disability and things that i couldn't do things and it was me drawing pictures of those kids um and how can i tell their stories and make their life sort of different and that sort of kept me going and even though I was training as an actor I was still kind of you know filming things for families I was sort of practicing a lot of stuff while growing off before arriving to delete it um, I kind of look at social issues um, either through documentaries or to narrative. So we did Deleted and working on Reshaped, which is totally the abstract to um, what Deleted is about a man who fell in love with someone he met on Tinder. Five years later, they're stuck with a child and they both settle for a plastic and she settles, you know, for a dildo, pornography, and he goes for human life sex robots. So it's totally contrast, completely. Um, exploring how men deal with rejection and it's not often spoken. And for me to do a film, it has to come from a source of truthfulness. Deleted is I'm passionate about homelessness and things, and I put my whole passion in it. This was actually a personal situation for me. And I turned that pain into, from that breakup into this vast uh, imagination. What if this was fine? Five years later, what if I was stuck in with a child and as much as people saw me traveling with deleted, I was going through a lot of personal stuff that 
there were days I'd, I didn't eat for five, six, seven days and I ended up in the hospital, yet I was still traveling with deleted and things is all all right. But I realized that, you know, as I was coming to the end of it, is that we have that gift of adaptation. And that's what my kind of story and I want to tell, um, that we're always adapting. And that's how the name came, Reshaped. And so it's through comedy, suspense, and that's how I kind of, kind of want to go with this film. So I've been busy doing all of this and still preparing ahead, you know. There's so many options coming out since Deleted Us and my Academy winning cinematographers want to work and quickly wants to throw me into the deep ends of feature. And I feel like, no, I need to learn because I believe in organic, growing organically. So I need two more, three shots before I arrive and sort of plan with all that. So that's me in a nutshell, quickly, like what I do and who I am. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And uh, Thomas, if I can move on to you, tell us a little bit about yourself and your work. Yeah, no, of course, man. I can't actually top that, man. I mean, because he, he, he's inspired me so much. You know, so, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, and by the way, his short film is absolutely wonderful as well. Uh, oh, thank you, Thomas. Absolutely absolutely incredible. Incredible. Great work. Really great work. Um, well, I, I um, make films. I say I'm a writer, director. Uh, that's sort of my own kind of way of saying that I, that I uh, make films. But it's, uh, it's a strange journey because I was born in Nigeria. Uh, and I came here when I was about 12 years old. Um, and it was a strange sort of like a culture clash in a sense because I, I, mm. I, I came here and I was like, um, I wasn't quite sure if I was a, a Nigerian man or an Englishman, you know, because I, I, I left my, my home, which was, you know, a, a very black space. And then, I, and then I came here and it was a, a, a very white space. So for years, you know, I was trying to be both in a sense and, and I wasn't one or the other. Uh, and that kind of messes with you, I think, a little bit because, you know, I mean, when I was 22, you know, you feel this sort of like this loss of just your roots in a sense, you know. And um, but I, I found film when I was about 14 years old and that really changed my whole life, you know, because I think film has this power to transform you, you mm -hmm. know, and it. It, it, it took hold of me really, you know, and I literally, I would wake up every day and watch films. And I was very sort of like shy in school, very quiet, you know, cause me, my, my accent was, was um, very African. So everyone would say, look, look, at, look at that, this, this, this African boy, you know? And, and I was like, wait, but I'm, but it was always by black people that would call me African boy. And that, and you're like, well, but you're, you're black as well. You're like me, but you see me as this other person, you know? Um, so film was like, Film really saved me, you know, it sounds incredibly far-fetched and, and quite deep, but it, it saved my life because every day I would go to Italy, Spain, France, America, through films, uh, you know, I was mm -hmm. transported through this medium. And, I, and for me, it just, it was very clear that my life was going to be in films. There was nothing else I was going to do. You know, I had to tell my African parents this, you know, didn't go down well because they were like, what, you know, um, but I just, it was so clear to me, you know, so I, I, I made my first film when I was, 18 years old in this house, actually. Uh, it was very bad. Um, you know, I don't know why it's, it's on YouTube, to be honest. That has to go down. Um, but <laughs> it's on YouTube. And, but that first film I made just opened my eyes to a whole new world. You know, I realized that, you know, uh, that I was born to really do this. And, you know, so, I mean, I've been making films now for 12 years, and it's been actually wonderful. You know, um, I went to film school when I was 25 years old and that's really what transformed my love for film because for years I was kind of just winging it I would say which wasn't a bad thing really because I was making good films but I didn't really know the craft of how to write films how to work with actors so you know being in that platform and that space for one year I learned all the craft of you know um, making films so my films was just so much better um, afterwards. Uh, and it, it was very expensive and I saved up for five years to go, but it was worth it. You know, m money well spent, um, I would say. Um, but, you know, my films are incredibly personal work. You know, they explore themes around my faith, around my culture, you know, and my, and my roots, but also not knowing who you are. You know, this sort of like dichotomy of, you know, being an Englishman, being a Nigerian man, you know, I mean, I, I, I dress a certain way, I talk a certain way, but then I was back in Nigeria last year and everyone kept saying, you're, and you're a white guy, you know, I was like, I'm not a white guy, I'm a, I'm a black man, <laughs> you know, so if your people don't accept you, how do you deal with that, you know, it's a very, yeah, so I think that my work is a safe haven for me to explore all these themes, and I'm so lucky that I have this platform to 
just explore things that have been, you know, going on in my life for the past few years. And, um, and I'm now working on my first feature film, um, which is very exciting because I think short films are wonderful. They're a platform where you can make 10 minute shorts. You can explore these, these narratives in this sort of like short space of time. But now with my, my first feature, I've got like 90 minutes plus to make a film that is, you know, that, 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 that means so much to me, you know, it says now it's just trying to get the funds to actually make that possible, <laughs> you know, and, 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 but also tell somebody that, I, you know, trust me with your money, uh, which isn't always very easy. But, um, but I think I'm lucky because I, I've made about like eight or nine short films, you know, because I just kept on making films that were self-funded by me, you know. So hopefully one person sees that film and says, okay, mm-hmm. here's some money, Thomas, and, you know, make this. Down. But it's, but even if that doesn't happen, I'm still going to make it because, you know, when you fall in love with film, nothing else matters. It changes your whole mindset and you have to make the film by any means possible because it, it's just a powerful medium that can change your life. And it's changed mine drastically, so. Amazing, thank you very much. And finally, Anthony. Yeah, so um, I'm a writer, director, producer, and actor. My background is quite similar to Stefan's where I trained as an actor for four years, um, classically trained, uh, went from drama school straight to theater. I was doing the Globe Theater. Uh, I was doing quite a bit of Shakespeare, touring around the country doing fringe, just doing all sorts of acting. And I guess my first experience with film per se was that I started writing plays. So I was writing plays, I was putting them on in theater pubs, I was putting them on in churches, I was putting them on in studios. Um, and then I just decided to, to, I had a love of film, a filmmaker called Alan Clark, who, you know, did he does these kind of, I, mean, I don't like the term like social realist films, but they were very social films focusing on certain issues such as, you know, hooligans or, you know, community and these, you know, anti-heroes. So I wrote a film called Hooligan. With, I funded that myself um, and it did, it did fairly well. Um, it, we got into the short corner in Cannes and then from there I just, developed a, a community. I went over to Cannes, developed a community with filmmakers, watched tons of films, read loads of books about films. And then I made one short film and then I was going to make another short film, but that short film ended up being a feature. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how that came about, but it just kind of, I just said by any means necessary, like Thompson was saying, I just said, look, I'm going to, no one was reaching out for funding. So I was like, look, I'm just going to make my projects. I'm going to do it. I was working four jobs. I was teaching. I was acting. I was an usher, theatre usher, cinema usher. And I just said, I'm going to make my film. So I made a film called Sweet Boy, which was back in 2013. I was, <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. I was like, I was like the lead actor in it, the director. I wasn't the writer. I was the producer. And I had no idea what I was doing. Like no, zero idea. I was, I wouldn't say I was winging it, but I was, what I did have was a passion, a work ethic, a drive. And I said, we had a story which was kind of inspired by, you know, it's this female revenge story, but it was also about a man seeking redemption for cheating on his wife and, you know, falling and just being, you know, someone who, who made these mistakes. So it's this kind of redemptive anti-hero. And the film ended up, I mean, everything that, that could go wrong went wrong doing this film, um, you know, from equipment breaking and insurance running out to it snowing to keys being down, chopped down the toilet and flushed. But we got the film made, we, we got it made. And yeah, that kind of set me on my path. But with regard to filmmaking, I'm just, I see myself as a student, a student always. I love watching like everyone in this chat. I've watched all your projects, um, a majority of them. And I've reached out to, like with Stefan with Delete, and I, um, like I watched his projects. I loved it. Tom's in, like Noza, like all your projects. I just love watching films i have a passion for for filmmaking for storytelling um my focus now is on 
there's a, a film that I shot called Spa, which focuses on boxing because I love boxing. I just, I've done a bit of boxing myself and yeah, I just love themes around kind of the physicality of the body. I have a film in development called The Tutor, which focuses on a ballet dancer who goes back to doing home tutoring. And she has to make a choice of whether she's going to tutor this boy or she's going to continue her passion of ballet dancing. Um, and that's been in development for about three years now. But I'm at the stage where my second film was a feature film. So I want to go back and make at least four short films before. I mean, if someone came up to me with the money and said, look, go and make the tutor, I would make it. But I, I, I I see myself as a student. I just want to keep refining my craft. I want to finish the Spa trilogy, do some other shorts, then go back and make my feature. Because even though I've had quite a bit of success so far, I just, I just love learning. I really love it. I find it addictive. I find filmmakers, I find actors. I love working with actors, being an actor myself. I just love, I love the whole community of creativity. So that's me. That's me in a nutshell. I keep on saying this to everyone, but I, I would love to have done this in person. So I just, I just think as we're all doing this online, how are you guys feeling being locked down? I mean, as we record this, we're sort of, um, I think we're about 16 weeks into lockdown. So how, how are you feeling? How, how, you know, how's everything going? I think for me, it's been, in, I find it quite a, a blessing. Um, I was supposed to start my narrative film, I think the 4th of April. And thank goodness this lockdown came in. Um, I'm always like adjusting the script and adjusting things. It's a personal story this time around. And to be able now to, when the lockdown sort of eased up, um, to go through now the shooting list. And I thought to myself, we're on set here. And actually I'm going to record without the actors. And I've realized how much preparation has been done to how the presentation of the film is going to look. Um, I'm using a lot of In the Mood for Love, um, the film. Mm -hmm. And so how that film was so beautifully done. It is, and even the flat we're filming, it's almost the same. So me and my art director were working so closely together. And I've realized that the walls, the shapes and everything. So for me, the lockdown has been whoo, so good. So good because I prepared so well. And my next film to me now is about the pictures. It's, it's all about that presentation that I bring. Mm -hmm. And so I got me so excited about that. And uh, so the lockdown has been all creative. It was hard. I haven't seen my family for some time, but you know, I was lucky to have this beautiful garden on that side so I can go out and be creative. And so I was just in between the garden and doing the Zoom meetings. So it was, was, was okay. It, was, it got really hard at some point, but I, I kind of got used to it and I was like, why am I getting used to this? You know, like, this is quite, okay, I'm resting. I don't have to work. And um, the money issue has been a difficulties, but you know, we got there. Mm. Yeah. How about, how about the rest of you? Thomason? Yeah, literally, like, I mean, the first sort of like four weeks was like, you know, I was losing my, my mind, I think, you know, I, I, I just, I love being at home, you know, home is comfortable, I can eat as much and uh, sleep all the time. But after four weeks, I was like, you know, um, it just wasn't normal. You know, I, I, I missed friends, you know, just seeing people, you know, very normal things. And, you know, so I think I lost my mind a little bit, I would say, um, because I, you know, I was eating all the time, you know, and I was watching a lot of films. You know, I mean, I love watching films, but um, it was just not a normal way for me because I, I was always out and about and, and I don't write at home. I always like to write outside you know and you know having to write at home was was very strange but then literally it's only in the past few months that i've actually now loved it because i realized wait a minute like i've got a time to actually just work you know i can most times you're always trying to create like oh okay i can't do this i've got to do that i've got to do this and, you know see this person but there's no one to see you know <laughs> so I, I was lying to myself for years you know just saying i can't do this because of this and and for the first time in my life i had nothing you know i had a time to actually work so it was on me you know and that's probably why i didn't like it because i you know if i didn't write anything it was because i just wasn't ready to you know so the past two months has been absolutely wonderful where i've um you know i sleep i sleep incredibly late now i've definitely gained yeah. weight i've gained weight so it's but it's fine <laughs> it's all good because it's all on zoom so no one can see the whole body anyway see the bottom so, half. It's all right. <laughs> i'm hiding my body right now so it's, it's all good it's all good oh that's a blessing 
I mean, for me, it's actually been all right. I've been um, in lockdown since pretty much the beginning, uh, just because I guess, you know, don't want to, a lot of my friends have like autoimmune, like, uh, you know, disease and stuff like that. So it's just like, make sure everyone's safe by like all of our circle kind of being on lockdown and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it's, yeah, it's definitely given me time to write. I write at home anyway. I actually like writing at home. So, Bye. you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, do. I don't know, man. I just like being Thanks, a hermit bro. that way. I just—it's just so much easier because I'm surrounded by all of my like inspirations, like books, DVDs, all of that sort of stuff. You know, you've got the internet, you've got some music to keep you going. Absolutely. So I'm just—I'm a sucker for all of that stuff. So it's like been really helpful. But then it's also obviously long out de- development processes, which like I'm really thankful for because you know something that I might have submitted at the beginning of this lockdown is definitely not as good as like I have now Absolutely. just from yeah. being able to refine it and refine it and refine it. Uh, Thomas and I feel you on the eating. <laughs> I definitely <laughs> eat a lot. <laughs> but um, that food. <laughs> yeah literally but I I got a bike so I'm like happily like being able to like go outside and at least do that for some exercise and then like come back into my little hermit hole. But yeah, it's not been too crazy. Yeah, I think for myself, I found I found it too, the first two weeks hard. Just the idea of not being able to leave my house unless it was for you know basic necessities or you know going for a stroll. Like I couldn't see my friends, couldn't see family, um, and then learning other friends being ill. So I found those two weeks really, really difficult. But then, like, kind of like all of you. I've kind of got used to it. Um, and now I'm at a situation where, well, I'm, I'm back doing my side hustle. My, my, my side hustle is teaching. So I've worked in the education system for quite a while, but I'm back teaching, tutoring a kid. So I'm, a, I'm going out after this to go and teach. But it's almost, I was getting quite comfortable because I was eating, like Tom's was saying, I was watching films. But I was two weeks out from shooting Spa 2 um, just before lockdown happened. And I think that this lockdown has been a blessing because it's taught me patience. Like, I, so there's so many times where I just want to go out and shoot, go out and make things happen. But I think this time has given me time to just sit down and just really, really be a fierce, fierce critic on myself um, and just allow me to like watch films, and just appreciate and yeah it has it has been a blessing like you know this is this is this is time that it's allowed me to kind of make the make use of so i mean it's not been it's not always been easy but it has been allowed myself to to enjoy you know every, other people's work but also to to write other things and i love writing at home like i love it so yeah <laughs> looking sharp there still Thanks. Oh. I'm Anthony, by the way. I see you wouldn't have met earlier. Fancy swearing later? Uh. Why not? Because I'm a girl. <laughs> no, I just. I don't know. I'll ask Barry then. What? You know what, I'm gonna I'm catch you around, yeah? And it's a question I was going to ask you a bit later on, um, but I think I'll probably just uh, jump into it now. So, you know, you mentioned the fact that your, you know, one of your earliest films was a feature um, mm-hmm. and you're currently developing your second feature. So I just wanted to find out about some of the, um, the experiences, the lessons that you learned making your first feature and how you're going to take that forward um, when trying to develop the second feature. I think the planning has to be meticulous. <laughs> but I think, I think, you have to prepare. Like I'm someone that I love inspiration, love positive people, but you have to prepare for the worst. You have to envision every ideal scenario that might actually go wrong because that's what happened with Sweet Boy. There's a, there's a story which I tell all the time that we, can aff- we were filming in North Devon, which is a four hour drive from London. And one of the actors, bless him, Joseph, he, ag- he agreed to drive the four hours to Devon from London. So we rented out the car 
an eight people people carrier and we stopped off two hours away from London and it was going well you know I'd got because you have to make sure that your actors believe in you as a filmmaker another thing but I and I had that the team on my side and everything was going well after quite a shaky start and then like I bought everyone coffees you know it's developing a rapport developing a community and then Joseph goes to the toilet and he comes running out of this toilet with his hands wet and everyone's looking at him it's like a big shopping center a petrol station you know the drop off everyone's looking at him his hands is wet so like, I've dropped the keys I've dropped the keys I've dropped the keys so like, what are you on about it's like yeah I, I dropped the keys down the toilet and I flushed it <laughs> so he had dropped the keys down the toilet for the car that we were going to drive to North Devon to film. So we had lost pretty much a day of filming. Uh, we had no keys to get to Devon. So I lost about, I was self-funding this film myself. It was a, uh, lost, lost about a thousand pounds because someone had to drive out from London to collect the keys. And it, at that stage I wanted to give up. So I think the team, I had the self-belief, but the team also got me through it. They, they were like, no, we're going to continue. Don't worry. This was, I was still learning it. Like I said, a student. So I'd say yeah. preparation, prepare for the worst, but also, you know, it's a team effort. It's a collective. You can't always do everything yourself. You know, that filmmaking is a collaboration, whether it's your DOP, your sound guy, your mixer, your editor, your actors. Um, so I'd say take those approaches when you're, doing your second feature, but also just a script. Just be meticulous with the script. Be, have that preparation and be, have that passion, but also be hard on yourself. Like, yeah. you know, be hard on yourself. Be, like I got my brother, he's a filmmaker, John, and he is, he's one of my inspirations because he's just a perfectionist. He, he's, you know, he does doc, like documentary filmmaking. He's got a film called Trim, it's on Vimeo. Brilliant film. Uh, he's just so meticulous. He'll make a film every year. He's doing the whole PTA, PT Anderson thing where he'll make a film like every four years. He's very meticulous with his craft. And that's what, one thing I've learned. I'm not in a rush to make my second feature film because I know yeah. that I want to do the steps with other short films and mm -hmm. I know that, you know, there's a, there's a lot more work to be done. But I think preparation is, is king and preparation is queen as well. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazing. So uh, I wanted to pick up on something that you all kind of alluded to, which was about, you know, just getting the film done, getting the film done by any means necessary in, these, in any means possible. And I'd love to sort of um, explore that a little bit more by talking about some of the practicalities about getting your work made. So if we could start with Thomas in this time, I'd love to find out a little bit more about um, your experiences with trying to get your work um getting it made. I mean, you, know, you mentioned that you self-funded quite a lot of your projects. Yeah. Um, how was that experience? What, what could you um, kind of um, disclose to us about, about that experience and, and about your sort of, you know, further experiences about actually making the work? Yeah, no, of course. I think it, it's, uh, it's not easy at all to be honest. You know, I mean, I've made eight short films in the past sort of seven years. And, um, you know, I think at least five of them have been self-funded by me. Uh, you know, it's not by choice. You know, I would like to keep those money, you know, really. Sure. Um, but uh, but I think that, you know, I mean, there are platforms where you, you can actually get funds to actually make your film. But, you know, the, you are up against a lot of people. You know, if, if you, all these platforms are absolutely wonderful, but they're, they have only, you know, maybe two funds for about 100 guys who are just trying to make their film so it's incredibly hard and I, I i tried that that route and it, it does work for some people where you know they get funds and then they make their film but you know i i think that you know you can do that but then you might have to wait for a few years and i think again you know when you love something so deeply you just want to do it you don't want to wait around for someone to say you know we'll see you now you know tell us about your film and actually unf unfortunately your film hasn't quite met what we want thank you so much for applying you know, I kept hearing this so much, you know, um, but going to film school was really what transformed my life because I think it was in that space because in, in school, it was a one year program. And in that one year program, I made about six short films. You know, it was mind blowing, you know, and I, it was made with like-minded people that just loved making films. So I realized that, um, you know, if you have the right 
team around you. You can do anything mm-hmm. ultimately. And that, that mindset has transformed my life because prior to film school, I was making films with friends that just didn't care about making films. You know, I had to call them up, you know, Hey, I used to come in, I'm on set right now. You know, the actors are here. Where's the camera? <laughs> you know, it's like, wh- what are you doing? You know, but these people were my friends, but they didn't love the craft. They didn't want to make films. So I was always the one I felt like I was pushing them to do it. And if you have to push your team to do films, then, then they're not the right people for you. Yeah. And I, I learned the hard way. And then I realized that the right team is very important. But then saying that is one thing, but also doing it is something else, you know, because ultimately if you have the right team, but you don't have any funds to even make the film, it doesn't really matter because the right team sometimes want to get paid. You know, yeah. you know they have bills and, mm-hmm. you know, no, some have kids, you know, and so ultimately I realized that if I have a part-time job where I can just work a lot, and then just save that funds and then make my film. So I, I did that. I worked in the theater for years. I would, I would, I would work as an usher. Uh, and that job was perfect because it was mostly in the evenings. So I would, I would you know, sell ice creams and programs and, and do all these things. And then in the weekends, I would make my films. And it was so wonderful because when you make films with certain platforms, they require certain changes for me, changes that don't always work in line with, with what you want. You know, I think it's wonderful with these platforms, but equally, I think, you know, having, you know, making the film that you want, ultimately, you have to just do it yourself, you know, but, but what, what was great about me was I knew how to make a film. I'd gone to, you know, this master's program for a year. So I knew how to write films. I knew how to work with actors. What I didn't have was the funds. And then, but if I, but my part-time job helped out so much. So I just basically had the right team of people and I just made a film, you know, but I think that, you know, it's, knowing ultimately what you want to say because if you have all the money in the world if you have the right team of people but you don't know what you want to say it doesn't matter ultimately Mm -hmm. you know so i had to learn that i spent a lot of years like like what type of films do i want to make because you know guys like spike lee you know i love his work but he had a very clear voice and he's mastered that voice over 30 years you know uh you know and i wanted to find out what my voice was so that was a whole different type of work and being in that master's program helped me a lot to find my voice because ultimately I, I meet guys who have a lot of money and who have the right team, but they make a lot of films that have no heart, they have no soul. And that is yeah. everything that really matters. And, you know, I'm 30 years old now and it's only now that I've now mastered my voice. I know what I want to say because I've spent the last 10 years just making a lot of films and through all these films, I found that, okay, I, I want to make films that expose my faith, my, my roots, you know, films about death, about love. So, Ultimately, the most important thing I'm trying to say is know your voice because you can have all the money in the world, you can have all the the best camera in the world, but if you don't, you know, if you don't have a voice, it doesn't matter. Your voice gives you your own sort of like um, your own kind of um, character because it's like you're making a film that expresses who you are, and I think mm-hmm. that everyone that inspires me as an artist, they are making films that is really about them. And, um, yeah. and that's really what I've really worked out. So all, you know, if you watch all my shorts, hopefully you see me in there. I think if you make a film and there's no evidence of you in there, that film is, I think it's quite sad and, and troubling because then anyone really has made this film. So ultimately I would just say, find your voice. And that's really what's helped me now, you know, because then when you, when you find a voice, then pe- the right people will come and work with you. You know, and hopefully my first feature film, you know, I'm working with a few platforms now who have seen my short films and who've realized, all right, Thomason has something he wants to say. Let's try and help him realize that. Um, well, they're saying that now. Hopefully they actually give me the money. But, um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but I think, you know, knowing my voice changed my whole life. And that's yeah. really what I would say that, you know, yeah, what films you want to make. And once you know that, work at it. Watch a lot of films and make a lot of films. What I do when you love me so? I don't know what I do when make you love me so. I don't know what I be when make you love me so. I don't know what you see when make you love me so. And that is why I go praise your name. Jesus, I thank you. Well, oh, well, oh. Jesus, I praise you. Well, 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 well,
the uh, distinctive voices um, from a lot of the shorts you made was was yours, Nossa. Um When I first saw something in the closet, I was immediately taken back by how strong the, uh, the the statement that you were making was in that film. And I was wondering if you could talk to us about that. I mean, would you agree with uh, Thompson's point about you know having your own voice and how important was it for you to really establish that voice with with uh, something in the closet? Yeah, I definitely would uh, agree with what Thomasin just said. I think like like him, I spent a lot of years being like, I don't know what my voice is yet. So like just kind of making sh uh, shorts and making things that like, you know, weren't necessarily great. I won't show a lot of them to anyone, but um, just kind of trying to figure that out. But I also think it comes from, you know, maturing minds and as you're growing you're figuring it out so you're not necessarily gonna have it all done and like dusted and put in a bow when you're you know when you're growing up because you're still trying to figure out who you are as a person so you might not know your voice yet and I think that's definitely the space that I was in and so you know my film school kind of was the internet and was YouTube and every day after like secondary school I would get on you know YouTube and just like type in like you know new web series or things like that because I wanted to see what my peers and people like me were doing because I think you know when you try and get into this industry it's so easy to become disheartened because there's a barrier with like not knowing gatekeepers who hold the money and like not having an audience getting your work being made but you know I could still do a, all of those things with you know a phone in my back pocket to make content or you know borrowing a DSLR from a friend's dad or something like that you know and kind of make my own things with uh, platforms and technology that were available which is why like I now call myself a platform agnostic filmmaker because that's how I got into doing all this stuff was kind of you know saying oh well, you know I have social media so like my audience I have an audience on that because my audience is friends and families and friends of friends and then they have their own audience if they share that is basically a distribution model so you know <laughs> that is it was kind of like figuring out you know how to do this stuff this stuff from scratch and then, you know, I was also very aware that no one was going to pay me anything for a while. And that was fine. I just wanted to make. <laughs> so, again, self-funded, self-funded content. But it could be really low budget content because I would have all of the like parts that I needed. Like, yeah, it just kind of sitting around the house. Yeah. And, you know, I also wanted to mimic journeys of filmmakers that I looked up to at the time. So, you know, Justin Simeon, Lena Waif was one, Hiro Murai. They were all putting out work on the Internet for their friends literally on YouTube and that's how I guess they started blowing up so I kind of thought oh if I mimic that maybe I could break into the industry uh, somehow mm -hmm. but um, yeah I think in terms of finding my voice I it was it took me a second because I was kind of just like well what films am I, am I not seeing and like it was films that I guess uh, I wanted to relate to as like a queer black person and you know it was kind of like well if people aren't making those I should I, and I can't see them necessarily in the mainstream I should just make them for like myself even and kind of figuring out okay well in that identity what is interesting for me to look at and I was a big fan of genre films growing up so like Steven Spielberg you know his sort of early stuff was you know kind of like my my thing that I would do like on the weekends and sit down and really like study, <laughs> study like Jurassic Park and all those things. And funnily enough, my cinematographer and I like really bonded over the making of something in the closet um, through watching like Jurassic Park because, you know, a lot of our like shots were kind of inspired by that with the like sort of slow push-ins and all that sort of stuff. And so it was kind of like figuring out, you know, what, what was my film language and also uh, what sort of stories was it that I wanted to tell and I realised that I wanted to mix genre storytelling with, you know, queerness and identity, like identity issues essentially. And so like that's kind of where my voice came out and like now I'm kind of deconstructing that in, in new ways to figure out, okay, what other stories could I tell that I relate to and I have, you know, I have like, you know, something that I can, yeah, that I can relate to basically. Yeah. Great, thank you. And um, Stefan, I'm going to ask you a slight variation of that question because um, one of the things that I'm interested in and one of the things I really wanted you to be a part of this was um, Deleted is such an incredible piece of work, but it's, it's a documentary, so very um, obviously a different style of film. Um, and, you know, I know you mentioned that you had some personal um, experiences with some of the themes that are raised in that film, um, but in terms of actually um, being able to talk about your voice when you're telling someone else's story, how did you go about that? And, and then could you tell me 
me a little bit about the documentary making process and how that differs from any fictional work that you might do? So it's a bit of a double question there. Um, I think for me, finding a voice um, is what I was just listening to Thomas and um, it's coming from here. And when you're true to yourself, um, who the kind of work that you want to do. I've studied, I think my first time, I think I was nine when I watched Nostalgia by Andrzej Taskowski and I was blown away. Um, I see my filmmakings because of my dyspraxia and all of those things that try to, how can I tell a story and because of disabilities and things that are not seen, funny enough, um, I see films like Chicken Soups. So the chicken soups to me are always like the chicken you see, I see the actors or the characters. The vegetables that you see them in there is the only way I can picture is the what I call the practitioners, people like Agnes Varda, there's Andrea Taskowski, the Leos Carax. And the way I mix them, mix them my practice. And I need to know from day one, what is my practice, finding it. So going to drama school at Central was not just acting, they trained me, they also trained me as a practitioner. And they were emphasizing a lot. What are those stories when it comes to documentaries, pieces of play? I was focusing a lot on cinema. I told them very clear, I know Central deals a lot with the Edinburgh Fringe. Can you help me with cinema? Because that's where the road I'm going to go. What is it about a piece of film that makes you want to do something? For example, documentaries, what I did with Deleted was experimental. I'm traveling with Deleted and I do understand what they're saying as a director. I have to talk about how I'm presenting it. And what I wanted to do explore with Deleted is take away all the pretty pictures, take away Stefan Pierre Mitchell and really put Ahmed, Mr. Siddiqui at the front line. To me, and I'm not going to name documentaries, I have watched beautiful pictures. I can't remember the subject they're trying to tackle because I was so blown away with the so much perfection. Documentaries are to do something when it comes to social issues and not praising the director. And so I stepped away. You're going to see the director in reshape in every aspect that you look at. What and I love avant garde. I love Robert Wilson. And I'm all about show it and don't tell it. I'm not a writer. I am not a writer, but I will tell you a story through less language and action and making it short. And so Deleted um, was something I really, and it happened. I was trying to do a documentary with Grenfell Towers. The four characters kind of pulled away. They didn't have the courage until Ahmed knocked on my door and asked for food. And I was blown away by his beauty. I was like, oh my God, this man would be so nice in a film. And I got to know him. He was suspended at that time for three months. Um, I started filming the early days of Deleted with the black crew. And as we do, and it's a whole conversation we have to make as black community about the approach we take to things. There's some unprofessionalism things. And... I've always been a courageous person. You know, I've grown up in foster homes and rebellious with family. I, I lived in Nigeria. At the age of 12, I ran away from home and I lived in Surulele in Lagos. As a white boy, eight months. And that was to me the beginning of freedom. And I've learned to be matured quickly and I've always been rebellious. And I could tell my experience and stories, and, but it has to come from here. So don't worry about what Mr. A and Mr. B is winning BAFTAs and Oscar. When you face your own race, you perfect your work. And so to me is what I want to tell. What I tell is different to what Thomason or Nota or Anthony. It's that's their journey. So I'm very confident in what I do because I put all my eggs and take everything in my energy into what I do. So when it came to Deleted, it took courage for me to take half of the footage that we started with Ahmed and said, you know what? Keep it. I'll start again. I'll start again. It's okay. It's okay. And take that and don't compromise your vision and your work because of lateness, because of attitude and because of things. So it was okay. I said, that's fine. And so when I was emailing DOPs and people to come join 
on this project. None of them wanted, nobody, nobody wanted to reply. And I was aiming for some DOPs that I really wanted to work with because I knew they're going to be professional and they're going to deliver. So I said, okay. I took my iPhone and I sort of reshot, deleted in 50 seconds. I went there, got soundscape, all of those things that I want to put, I'm putting into 50 seconds. Four years ago, before I arrived in London, my mom and my dad and my family, everyone came in and we visit London and we're at Abbey Road as tourists. And I said, one day I will come in there to come and make my music score. And there's a music score I loved. That footage got me Aaron Green, who was very busy doing work. He never replied to any of my emails. As soon as I sent that footage, within five minutes, he replied, I'm coming. I was like, good, I'm getting my DOP. Matthew Slater, I've watched his thing with James Bond, everything, da, 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 same thing. Saw that footage of 50 seconds. All of my ideas and everything that I wanted to achieve were there in those places. And they begin to shape up. So when I gave up on those footages and that problem that I had starting in September, then comes to the filming. It was planned for February. The tribulations with this film, but I never lose hope. And then on a Saturday evening, a month earlier before shooting deleted, Ahmed knocks on my door and said, I've come to say my goodbye. I'm like, what do you mean? I thought you're moving in February. No, I'm leaving tomorrow. And this is Saturday evening, 10 o'clock. My face dropped. I haven't got a phone. I haven't got a film. What do I do? I called Aaron. Aaron said, oh my God, he doesn't do it. Aaron is at the level where he doesn't even own equipment. Companies are getting him because he works incredibly well after their BAFTA nomination with their film. So he works, you know, he doesn't even own. But he said, let me look around. Don't panic, Stefan. See what I can do because I want to tell this man's story. And so luckily in the morning, nine o'clock, Sunday morning, he said, oh, my friend, he hasn't returned this Sony. I said, has he got 4K? Perfect. My producer said, I'm going to look you for the sound, you know, boom operator with sound. If I'm Michael Clayton Jr., 10 years experience, BAFTA crew, you name it, this guy had it. I said, that's it. We're going to have a film. It was a five hours interview, no tripod, no nothing. But prior to filming Deleted, two years ago, a homeless man stopped me. And I gave him money, we had a chat, and he looked into my eyes and said, thank you for looking into my eyes. And that really hit me. And I said, I'm gonna cut every gimmicking and we're gonna look into this man's eyes. But also take the audience, making the audience departments for works and pension. When you go for health assessment, I've been through them. They say, oh, can we see your finger? Can we see your eye? And I wanted to, to play around with that and see how much can we, this man, one film, one camera, one boom operator can affect people. My only message is, please, somebody in government, don't take this just as a movie. Do something. People are suffering unnecessarily. And when I say unnecessarily, because of the governance that we have. It's not right. It's not right. And thank you all very much, and I wish you all good luck in this. A voice needs to come out, and like I said, come out, have your say, speak. Don't riot, don't swear, don't shout come together collectively. And I know there's a lot of middle-class people, a lot of quiet people that I've seen suffering. Make your voices heard. We might start as a whisper, but we can end up roaring if we work together. Government shouldn't do this, it's wrong. I'm out of it. I'm getting out of it. But other people aren't like me, they can't. They need support. But from there, I wanted to go to the next level. What are those professionalism things that you do? Divide yourself, different, different departments. I always wanted to go with the mill. Incredible company that does the grading to give me that script quality. Also, you're looking at editors. Okay, that was a bit of issue, but you know, we got there at the end. To give a good quality, because I wrote when I was seven, when I was seven on my book, my first film will not go free for all. Somehow, this film is not gonna go when we finish ending the tour. We have platforms where people will pay to watch it, but even then I'm giving it away to homeless charity with the Evening Standard newspaper. Always try to give out. This documentary to me has arrived me here, has given me so much opportunity and I continue to give back. It is about change in this film. And there's something about this film that got me a publicist. She told me when she sent this to Sky, ITV, Lorraine, 
everyone they saw this year within minutes. She said she's never seen anything like that in her 10 years experience. How can a film affect even media to have you in the office? Normally it takes three to four weeks to get them. Yeah. And so now preparing with marketing, and I knew that the marketing is important. I'm going to film festivals. I was going to the workshops and they were talking as a filmmaker from day one, you need to understand marketing. I'm already planning ahead marketing for feature, original soundtrack with Sony Records. So you have to really put your mindset and think like a professional. And that's why it took me four years to get it. But I've gone through trials we deleted to go there. Festivals, yeah. yes, they called it, you know, it's literal, it's this and that. That's okay. I make films for audience. The other ones that will be going, sorry, it's gone off. That, that will be going into cinemas and watch it. And that's how been my process with deleted and to yeah. the next work that I'm going to do. And that's okay. Thank you very sorry. much. No, that, no that's, that's fine. I, 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 I love the passion. I love the passion behind the project. And, yeah. you know, one thing that is so inspiring to hear, you know, having this conversation is, the, the sheer determination to get your vision across, and that's that's something that I will always admire and you know be inspired by with filmmakers such as yourselves. Um, but I'd like to um, just talk to Anthony about um, Spa because um, that was a film that um, we we screened at one of our events and a film that we really love. And um, one of the things that I loved about it was the fact that you were using movement in the boxing ring. Um, in such a, in such a, it was such a really clear way, in such a you know, focused way. And I'd love to talk to you about the movement and how you know some of the challenges that are kind of associated with you know trying to capture movement, and movement, and action on on the screen. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, I think in preparation to Spa, the vision was I was watching a ton of boxing films from Champion with Kirk Douglas to the Rocky franchise, to Raging Bull, to Girl Fight, to Million Dollar Baby. And then, like a lot of you have said, I thought, do you know what? I'm not in competition with those films. This is my film. You know, this is, this is a film that I wanted to be a tribute to boxing. Man, you need to focus on your boxing, bro. Oh, She's saying. cute, man. You got a fight coming up. <laughs> she is, though. Hey, she looks like the girl from yesterday, oh, isn't it? Girl. It is the girl from yesterday. She was with the group. She was with the group. With the tall brown skin girl. Yeah, the heels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. It is. It is, man. Yeah. Mad at she doing here, though. Come on. Why is she here, though? <laughs> she does it. Yeah, she does it. She does it. She's nice. She's probably knocking me out. All right, boys, listen up. This is Isabel. She's with us for the day. If she needs any assistance, no questions asked, just do it. All right? Okay, carry on. So with regard to that, I told Jed, who was a cinematographer, I gave him my mood board, which was a compilation of different boxing films. But I said, look, watch this, get inspiration, and then forget it. Like, take, take that inspiration and then build your own vision off that. This is just your energy. But in terms of it, I, I see Spar as... It's almost like a, it's my tribute to boxing and it's everyone who was on set had to do the, the work ethic. And like, if you watch boxers work, I don't know who's familiar with boxing, but this is one of the hardest sports ever. Like I've, boxed, I've, I've done boxing in front of 500 people for real, white collar, and it's the training that goes into it. You have to diet, you have to make sacrifices. No alcohol, no this, no, that. All it is, is it's you in a ring and you've got your trainer and you've got your craft and you've got to work at it 24 seven. And in terms of the movement, I said, fit, think of it less of a sport and think of it more like a dance. Like oh. there's a lot of a, a dance motion with boxing and that's why they call it the sweet science. It's almost like a ballet, it's poetic. I, you know, I think there's a misconception that it's, um, it's a sport of brutality. I think it's a sport of beauty. And that's what I really wanted to come through with Spa. Um, and I said that if, if you watch the film, there's a montage that we have in it and they're training and they're doing the mitts and the pads and the press ups. And this was for real. There was no, I said to Jordan, Nicola, Andre, all of them, I said, do the work. Like they were getting exhausted on set. But I said, look, this is what boxers do. Like we can't shortcut it. So 
but I told him, think of it as a dance. Like boxing is, is beauty, it's poetry. So when we were shooting it, I said, I told Jed, who was a, cinema, who was a cinematographer, brilliant cinematographer. I said, really, really capture it in that sense. Um, and just think of about the levels, you know, what are we trying to say when we're filming from below? You know, what's that saying in terms of status, in terms of, you know, hierarchy, et cetera? Like, what are we trying to say? Um, so in terms of the kind of movement, it's all, it's, I, I see it. I love, I love dance films. I love dance. I was watching, um, it's Pina Bausch. I don't know if I'm saying her name correctly, but I was watching one of her dance I love films her. the other day. And I was just, I just love it. I love ballet. I love all of it. And I think that, there is a connection with that and sport. And that's what I told my crew, my actors to, to go around that way. Think of it less of sport and, and less of what's on the TV and less of these other films, which are great films. Creed, the Creed franchise, the Rocky franchise, they're all great, but let's try and do our own thing with it. So, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> the reason that we're all here today is um, part of the Who We Are takeover. And the takeover is really all about celebrating Black British from past, present and future. So it's at this time I'd like to do a bit of a round robin and find out from you guys about your, the, the film, a Black British film from, a part, from the past that you may have connected with and tell me a little bit about why. So it could be from a personal point of view or a professional point of view. So Nosso, if I can start with you, what, what, would, what would be your film that you would that you would sort of point to as, as, as a film that's either inspired you or just a film that you perhaps really just like? Um, yeah, I would definitely say um, Destiny Ekaraga's uh, first feature, uh, Gone Too Far, mm. um, which I just thought was like, obviously um, ambitious, but like really authentic, like adaptation mm -hmm. of um, Bola Abaje's um, like award-winning play, basically. Yeah. And um, it's about, well, you guys have seen it, but for anyone else, uh, it's, it's about, <laughs> yeah, it's so good. Um, a sort of black British Nigerian uh, kid, well, teenager, um, who's sort of turn around, turned around by the arrival of his, his brother, who's sort of this, like, portrayed as a loud, proud uh, Nigerian <laughs> and, like, coming over coming over from Nigeria and you know these two brothers have clashing identities and you know their mom sends them out to get some okra and like their day sort of spirals out of control and like yeah I really loved it I remember I saw it during uni uh, and I saw it three times um, just in its like first week and actually got to see uh, Destiny like speak a few times about it and I was just I was really blown away by it I think just directing wise you know the actors and like keeping the pacing on point with like the comedy and the dramatic elements and I think it was just really a confident like it had a confident fun sort of attitude about it for like a feature debut and it was directed and written by two black women which like I'd literally never seen before so I was just like you know this is super inspiring for me to see as sort of a young black female film student and like really pushed me to keep on keeping on with my career because you know coming from you know having a um, traditional sort of Nigerian mom who was just like you want to do film what was film <laughs> you know <laughs> I was just like no someone else has done it they're Nigerian too I can do this <laughs> and um just yeah it was just a really really good story so yeah I definitely would say that that is a film that like a black British film that stands out for me Great choice. And I mean, that's currently on the BFI player as part of the, not to plug our own selves, but that is on the BFI player as part of the We Are Parable selection. So do, if you haven't seen it, do check that out. Um, part, if I jump on to uh, Thomason, what would be your your Black British film of choice? Yeah, no, of course. Mine would be a film called, um, I, I don't know if you heard of this film called Second Coming uh, by yes. Debbie Tucker Green. Yeah. yeah. I Incredible. mean, I saw Second Coming, I saw that film, I think, a few years ago, and it, it was shown on uh, on um, Sky, and I, I, you know, I'd, you know, I'd seen like, you know, some some, some sort of like um, stills of the film, and and I'd I'd sort of heard about it, but you know, I hadn't actually watched it before. And um, there's something about the film that really just like moved me. You know, I think firstly seeing a black film like that from this incredible artist. You know, I mean, her plays are absolutely wonderful. So I know, and it, it was a first film. 
So I was very, very keen, you know, just to watch the film. And then I didn't know what to expect watching the film because, you know, I'd read the kind of, you know, the little kind of like outline of the film. So, you know, in my head, I knew what it was going to maybe be like, but then you watch the film and you're just like mind blown by just how powerful it is. You know, I think it's, it's a very rare film because in a, in a way it's incredibly nuanced um, because loads of things happen in the film, but it's, it's done in this incredibly subtle way, you know, seeing all these characters there and seeing this sort of like narrative which escalates you know and and seeing all these characters because again you know i've seen black films where everything is very overt you know it's it's in your face it's out there but you know, this film had this incredible quiet just this silence that was always there you know each scene had so much depth but it was also very multi-layered as well and 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 it, it was a first film so it, it it inspired me so much because i've never seen a debut feature that had such layers to it you know and you know i i watched it and i remember for for weeks it was just on my mind you know because in a way what happens in it it's like a dream almost seeing all these characters go through all all these things but it's also seeing that a voice shone through that film so clearly you know it was very clear that you know that only her really this film was her voice it, it was really her way of saying you know like i made this film you know you, you might not get it, but that's fine, you know. And and at first, I didn't really understand it. You know, it, it was only days afterwards that I, that I realized what it was actually trying to say, you know. And I think I wouldn't say what it's about because I think you have to just watch the film because if I say too much, it gives away everything. I mean, what I would say is expect the unexpected because the film subverts everything you think it will be. But also just seeing a black British film like this, you know, I don't think I've seen anything like that before. You know, and it was made with it was made with such boldness and such sort of poise, um, and it inspired me so much because I think that you know when you're trying to make your first feature, you're trying to make work that you you feel that you know, everyone would like. You're trying to make work that would sell, you know, or make money. And seeing, you know, seeing this film that really had such a very clear voice, but also had a, had a very clear style, you know, and it was shot in this incredibly powerful way. You know, seeing. Idris Elba act in a way I hadn't even seen him before. You know, seeing all the actors give him so much, you know, I'm, it inspired me. And I, I, I've seen all her plays and seeing how she translates a voice in her first feature film is inspiring. So it's a film I watch every year, just to realize the power of film, but also what film can do if you really have a very, very clear story. And I'm, yeah, it's, I can talk all day about it because it's just, it's a masterpiece. And I think it's a shame that not, it hasn't been seen so widely. So I mm -hmm. tell all my friends about it, watch Second Coming because it's a, it's a film that is just incredibly bold and very powerful, so. Yeah, that's, that's another great choice. I mean, um, it's Debbie Tucker Green's first film, but it's actually Debbie, Tuck, Debbie Tucker Green's only film. Um, so I'm yeah, hoping that she, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, that she does create something else because it is, it is a masterful piece of work. So thank you very much for that choice. Um, Anthony, can I go to you? What, what would be your film of choice? So your... my film would be a film uh, which is called, it's a television film. It's called Storm Damage. And it's written, the writer is Lenny James, who is an actor. Um, he did The Walking Dead, Save Me, a couple of other things. Um, I won't go too much into what it's about, but I'd say it, it's a teacher that goes back to a care home which he grew up. And it's, I watched it as, a t I watched it as when I was in high school as a teenager and I re I've revisited it several times. It's in the BFI Media Tech, it's on YouTube. Um, and the film just deals a lot with a commentary on, you know, community, family, you know, mentorship. Um, there are the, there are raw performances. It's, like, it's one of Ashley Walter's, I mean, I know he did Grain Short, but I think it's it's one of his early, yeah, early roles. Yeah. And his his energy is just I think it's it's testament to him as an actor, but his energy in that film is it's relentless. Um and it's just something to do with I think it's a commentary on I don't want to get too political here, but I think the social issues and you know, outreach projects that are going on and you know it makes me think about, you know, funding issues to do with outreach projects. Yeah, I've worked in education for a number of years. I've been in classrooms. 
uh, public and private and just seeing how important education is um, to, to our growth, to children's growth. And this film is it's a commentary on all those things. And it's tragic, it's funny, it's beautiful, but it just shines through. Um, and yeah, just that whole thing about, you know, family, uh, being a father figure, being a um, mother figure, like just those things shine through, through. But I just think it's important with regard to education. Like my, my whole thing right now, and I'm not gonna go off on one, but I, I really wanna see black history taught in schools at the moment um, because I think it's, it's, it's important not only to inspire, but I think when you have your history hidden, mm. um, you know, there, there could be a new generation of astronauts, of filmmakers, of actors, of, you know, entrepreneurs, uh, lawyers. And I think when you have your history hidden, you know, it, it, it can create doubt. But when you, when you are provided an education, it creates unity and it creates understanding. And these things are all mentioned in, in Storm Damage. So I would highly recommend that film, highly. I'm gonna, I'm gonna revisit that. It's been a couple of years since I've seen it, so I'll definitely, yeah. I'll definitely revisit that one. Thank you very much. And Stefan, finally, um, tell us about your, your film choice. Uh, you see, uh, people are gonna find more about the kind of filmmaker I am. I'm quite weird in the way my pictures are told. I mean, I'm talking a Russian cinema. And so, I was, um, so I'm drawn to you know, images that are more subtle and, and I kind of run away from black films that are quite picture in your face and I, I, it doesn't appeal to me but I'll give a few shout to a few films that I think it stood out for me watching you know and I remember this old school film was like Young Soul Rebels I think in the 90s yes, yes. and that oh, really that, that really stood out to me you know the two characters and you know that double prejudice from you know racism and homophobia coming but from the West Indies and the British communities and that 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 stood at us. I was like, okay, this is bold. I, I like films that are bold but not forceful. And to me, that's um, um then you know we've got Ama Sante because I think there's something about her movies that sort of explores the real, you know, a being mixed race, you know, with Belle really connected with me, what she was going through and the complex social interactions and, you know, myself, I know when I was in Nigeria, they used to call me a white boy and then in here in the UK Northeast, when I grew up in a very racist area where the EDL, you know, the EDL kind of movement is very strong in Durham and Middlesbrough and they were like, black step, black step, how are you black step, you know, you know, that kind of thing, going with the lies and skinheads and so I've always been, you know, in between these cultures and I went and lived with my grandma in the Bahamas at 15 just to get to know my culture and everything and even then they were like oh e my god you know why step from London has arrived you know and I was like oh my god again it's so bell but I like Amanda that she's always bringing history when I remember going to the opening of BFI and I saw what she did with a United Kingdom I was like oh my god there were black people in the 50s owning Oxford streets and shops and things and and I just realized how we as black British filmmakers we can change the narrative and change the history and the landscape of how our times are um so these are kind of films that I sort of pick you know and of course the British film I know it's not directed by a black but to serve with love with Sydney Portier oh my god I just adore that film and you know I'm, I'm in love with that actor and i think he's a freaking legend and um, i love films like that so i i think to studies the 40s the 20s silent movies are something that we're training at drama school about telling the stories in powerful with no language so i run away from you know show it but don't tell it yeah. and find interesting sharp sharp images that makes you want to oh oh and uncomfortable it's okay it's not everything that is rosy in life yeah and so my things are very quirky and the way I'm going with the direction I'm going because I, I know that's who I am towards filmmaking. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. So one final question just to finish up on. So as, as I mentioned at the top, um, this is a conversation really to um, inspire uh, Black British creatives. So what I'd love um, you each to do is to just give me one 
a succinct piece of uh, advice you would offer to a, a you know a, a creative who is trying to get their work or their project off the ground so um anthony if i could start with you and then we'll just um we'll just work our way around okay so i'd say speaking to an actor about this and i, I think you can put it in the same context as film he said that you don't have to be on the job to act you don't have to be on the job to act so i think that applies to filming you don't have to be necessarily quote unquote making a film making a project you can you can collaborate with your friends you can collaborate with your family uh you don't have to have the dslr or the red or the ARRI. you can use your phone you could use your laptop so you don't necessarily have to be on a job to make films um and like stefan was saying passion mm. you have to have that passion mm. regardless it does get hard you know um that's what robert rodriguez rebel without a crew i funded a majority of the slate on my production company and i just think the vision and the passion has outweighed anything it's all part of the struggle if you believe in what you're doing then it's it's it should be fun it's going to get tough mm. um but just have 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 passion have faith you know um and be grateful i'm very grateful very very grateful for for everything for the good and bad and there has been there has been bad mm. there's also been good and i'm just grateful so i'd say you know diy and you know passion and purpose Thank you. Nossa, if I could move on to you, what would be your advice for creatives? Yeah, um, I, I think I have like two succinct bits of advice that I would always say is that find, you know, the right collaborators. I think kind of going back to what Thomason was saying from before, it's just like, you know, you want people with the same amount of like ambition and passion as you. So you kind of all uh, like, you know, you're all aligned in the vision that you're going for. But then also you want to pick people that you know you could just chill with have dinner yeah. with watch B buffy the vampire slayer with do you know what i mean <laughs> like you know you have to i feel like the turning point for me is just finding people that i really like i'm a fan of their work yes but i like them as people and i want to be mm -hmm. friends with these people you know and that just creates an already great environment for when you're on set and things are stressful anyway but you don't want to do you know you don't want to make a a film where you're stressed and then you're also stressed about the team that you're working with so mm -hmm. just find the right team and also I think in these I guess COVID times maybe <laughs> think about you know switching up how you might uh, create a film because you know uh, just like Anthony just said you know you don't need the red you don't need the Alexa you don't need all of this sort of stuff you have the tools in your in your house so if you want to do something low budget why not film on your laptop get a bunch of your friends together over Zoom, make a Zoom film, you know, make a, make a film on your, on your smartphone. Maybe make a film on your voice device if you have an Amazon Alexa, you know, just, just in these sort of uncertain times around uh, film practices, think creatively and maybe look to adapting newer technologies for how you can, how you can make a film. Yeah, most definitely, most definitely. And um, uh, Thomason, if I can move on to you. Yeah, of course, man. I mean, what's been quite nice again, you know, I've been at home for the past, you know, three months. And I think what's been quite nice, you know, I've eaten a lot, which, which I've said earlier. <laughs> but, but, but what's been quite good about being at home is the fact that I've just watched a lot of films. And I realized that I, I, I meet, you know, aspiring directors who, you know, I, I, I ask them if they've watched some films. They're like, no, I haven't really, I don't really watch films. You know, I just like to make films. And, you know, respect to you, right? If you want to just make stuff, great. But there's no context if you don't watch films and it, mm -hmm. it's incredibly baffling when I meet people that have this passion for filmmaking but they haven't seen classic films mm -hmm. you know anything in black and white anything that's like yeah you know they, they they despise black and white films and for me you know obviously I went to film school and that's really where I found my voice but I actually realized that you know my my film language was actually formed by watching you know like old films you know like mm -hmm. the French New Wave, seeing films by Ozu, seeing films by PTA, you know, seeing, you know, Russian cinema, seeing a lot of classic films. And, and I realized that, you know, these films were made 70, 80 years ago, but they actually have a lot more depth than most modern films. Because if you think about it, like this, you know, I, I saw a film called 
Bicycle Thieves, right? I saw that film last night. You know, that's a film. Great film. 1941. 1941, almost 70 years ago, right? And I'm like, this film translates so much human sort of like um, themes. And it's such a powerful film. But this film was made in Italy. I wasn't even conceived then. I wasn't even realized mm -hmm. then. But, but I'm watching the film in my bedroom in 2020. You know, I, and it's such a powerful medium where, you know, we have these old films. You, you can go on YouTube and find these films. And what I find baffling is people don't want to watch classic films and but i but i think i learned how to direct by watching these films i learned how to write by watching these films so my advice is just watch films you have absolutely no excuse because you're not going anywhere right you're home right now you know i mean i think it's easy just to watch newer films because you know it made money in the box office or your friends know about it you know um my parents don't get me because i would be up all night watching these films from the 20s and you know my you know they don't understand why i do that but then I'm, i tell my dad like this film translates something that is that is that transcends just cultural themes this film you know these are human stories that doesn't matter where you're from you know if you're black if you're white if you're asian this film it, um it's powerful you know so i always say watch a lot of films and because you, you understand how film is a medium that translates something that is very simple. You know, it translates, you know, love and heartache and death, you know, themes that, that it doesn't matter where you're from, it affects us all, you know. So I've, I'm, and there's so much films to watch. You can't watch all the films in the world, but there are so many films you can do. And just, and I, I do it by watching just like, I'm going to watch this film by this person, you know, and, and mine now is, um, Billy Wilder. I'm watching all his films. I've, I've, I've watched his early films. I'm watching, you know, the films he made in the 40s and 50s and 60s. But you realize that Wilder translated, like, these powerful stories, you know? So, you know, I'm a better artist because of these films. And I always encourage anyone that I meet at festivals that they love my work. I'm like, if you see my films, you can see the semblance of these classic films in there. It's, it's obviously inherent in the narrative strand. It's inherent in the language of the films, but I've just made it my own. You know, you are nothing without history. And I think I've realized mm -hmm. that the history of filmmaking has shaped my own history. You know, because I'm, and I'm praying that in 30, 40 years time, my film will be watched by people then, you know. So yeah. just watch films. It's incredibly simple cost you absolutely nothing you know you don't have to buy a camera you know i mean I, oh just watch films it's it will change your life and it changed mine and you know the best thing about life is you can just sit in your house and and travel to all these countries in the space of a day and yeah. and be be informed in all these cultures and learn about things that you never learn about you know so watch films it's incredibly simple brilliant i love that and finally uh stefan yeah, so much connect with Thomas and like, uh, <laughs> uh, he doesn't understand and, and what Nosa said about getting the people that we want to have a laugh. Like I'm working out with my art director, we're just having a blast. <laughs> my DLP, like we're getting pictures, like, oh my God, Michael, look at this shot. Oh, let's get this. And like, it was just like having a laugh. We're not even taking seriously. Have fun, have fun. Having said that, like Thomason said, watch films for me has shaped who i am today because i'm going back to the roots of filmmaking and i told you i'm going back to charlie chaplin and i'm going out oh my god he actually sold that story and i'm looking at how performances were done by him to tell me the story and then now introduce lines and then going back to modern time as well and don't forget that we have filmmakers around us that are alive like people like ourselves here like i keep saying i came back to london i've watched the godson by thomas and i was like I was blown away by this. So I get in, in, less inspired even by the people around us as well. I'm um, watching films. When writing, please, I've seen somebody writing that is flying up in the air. How are you going to film that? One location thing, it's always the best. <laughs> One, yeah, yeah, yeah. Flights, people. I was like, where are you going to have the people? <laughs> like, oh my God. No, and he was putting funding. He didn't take. He's putting oh funding to BFI. I was like, it's it's not going to be achievable. Yeah. One location is the best way. You can use the kitchen, the bathroom, the this, you know, and then the external shot. One location is always cheaper. I think when you're putting this together, mm -hmm. it's cheaper to film. You know, as much as you see, deleted was. I don't think I spent more than six hundred pounds on that film. But I have people investing. Yeah. It would have cost me. The mayor said, don't worry, we'll do it because we like the topic. 
the topics are very important for people to come in to get the job as well and how you tell it. First, you start, you just start it. If you make mistakes and watch films and watch what the film festivals are curating so that you know what is expected when you want to try and to get to that semi-professional kind of all yeah. and, and have a laugh and travel the world and see places, you know, because <laughs> you learn things, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know. That, that, I mean, me. that, that is all fantastic advice. So I, I'd, just like, I'd just like to say thank you so much for being a part of who we are. Um, I think you guys are on, you know, you are destined for greatness. All of you, I, I love all of your work and we love it here at We Are Parable. So thank you so much for being a part of it. And nothing else for me to say than thank you to Anthony Vanda, Nasa Eke, Thomas and Edda Peju and Stefan Pierre Mitchell. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank, you. So thank, you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. <laughs> Thank yes. you. So nice to see all the creative come together and say hi. People I've not met, but today I've met, and we're going to see more work. And so, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Amazing.